that the Word of God is the bread of life. Sometimes, and Paul talked about, uh, even liked it unto another metaphor, he likened the certain levels of teaching to be strong meat versus milk. And uh, tonight, if I can use that metaphor, I'm just going to say, to be honest with you, and tell you, for dinner tonight, I've thrown on a slab of meat. So, since we're here, what say we really pay attention to the, and eat what the Lord has for us tonight? Zechariah chapter 4, and I'm just going to read verse 6 because it is our theme verse for the series that we're in. When he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto, unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Everybody say, By God's spirit. So, we are talking about engaging the spirit. And tonight, uh, we've been talking about some various ways that we engage the spirit. But tonight, I'm going to do part four. And as a subtitle, I'm going to call it, this particular segment tonight is Instruction in Righteousness. And here's why I say this. We've been talking about how God can and will speak to us through spiritual means. And we've talked about some of the various ones. The last couple of weeks, we've spent time talking about dreams and visions particularly and uh, but tonight I want to go a little different direction I want to talk a little bit about where do some of these dreams come from and or what is the source of them or what are possible sources and I want to talk to you about the role that morality or immorality as the case may be what morality, the role morality plays in spiritual gifts and operations. Very critical Bible study tonight. I want you to close your eyes where you are, lay your Bible down, and I'm asking you to lift your voice up and pray for the Word of the Lord to come forth in strong anointing tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people of God that have gathered on this beautiful Wednesday night for midweek Bible study. Lord, let an anointing of teaching come into this house. Help anoint my mind and my mouth that I could be the voice of the pages tonight. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. And then if you would, one more time, give him a hand clap offering and a shout of praise to go with. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. When I describe those events that sometimes when you have a dream and the dream in, in the night while you're sleeping and the dream is so real and so vivid that it literally pulls your emotions into it. To the point where you're literally even having a physical response, such as sweating and so forth. I mean, you're, you're just, and then you wake up, and for a moment, you're rattled until it hits you. Oh, it was just a dream. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. When I find out that that crazy mess that I was just thinking and dreaming about was just a dream. <laughs> so we understand that God can and does speak to us from time to time through dreams, but we've also identified the fact that dreams come from other sources as well. Now we've talked a little bit about this, but listen, you need to be careful. Let me say something to the church. 
you need to be careful where you get your, your, your information from. We live in the information age. And the internet, somebody said it a long time ago, is full of knowledge, but not very much wisdom. <laughs> full of all kinds of facts, some of which aren't even true. So I'm going to give you some strong advice tonight. Bring up 2 Timothy 3. And some of these verses are familiar to us, and some I use may be a little less familiar, but I want to remind you this. The Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. How many of you can testify that you've lived long enough that you can say, I'm talking to the older adults here now, that you can identify how things have gotten worse I have problems we were having on spiritual deceptions when I was a young man are rather toying compared to some of the stuff that I see unfolding today. And here's the point. It's not going to get better. It's going to get continuously worse as the end of the church age unfolds. And it said they will be deceiving and being deceived. Even the deceivers are deceived. There's so much deception going on, nobody even knows what... What in the world's happening? And everybody is convinced they are right, but there's so much confusion and things that have been loosed. And the Bible described it this way, that there would come a time, and we're in it, that they would, there would be so much confusion and deception that they would call good evil and evil good. Now you need to wake up and understand, we're in that time. And some of you that are goofing around with your spiritual life and your children's spiritual life, if I could use the metaphor, but you need to wake up and smell the coffee. Because you are living in an hour where deception is loosed like an unbelievable thing. He said, here's how you survive. Verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. In other words, I don't buy into something just because I heard it. I have to test some things. I have to know, I have to try something, know, learn that this actually does work. But not only that, I also need to be sure by knowing of whom thou hast learned them. What was the source of the teaching? And then he, of course, goes to the safest source. From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Be careful not to open your spirit up to just any voice. Because there are many untested voices of deception. And the Bible even says that Lucifer himself is able to masquerade as an angel of light. And I'm telling you that the internet and, and TV and media and all, is full of fancily dressed up and well presented false doctrine. It's full of it. And I get a little bothered when I hear people who are supposed to be apostolic saints of God acting mesmerized by some of the things that they hear and see. And I wonder... Why is it that their level of discernment has so, is still so childlike? When they've been around the house of the Lord for long enough for it not to be childlike. You see, some things are divine. And other things are divination. And you have to know and learn the difference between them. And in order for that to happen, we've got to desperately seek wisdom and discernment from God. Because not only, and let me say, it's not only just a matter of being able to discern what is right and what is wrong, where it really gets tricky is when you're having to try to discern when oftentimes right and wrong come mixed together. And you're put into a position, you know, you sit down to dinner and you got mashed potatoes on one side and green beans on the other. It's not hard to discern the difference. But if somebody worked it up into a goulash and sat it down, I'm going to have to take the time to discern 
and, and, and separate out. But what most people do is they don't take the time to do that. They're just going to sit and eat what they've been given. And in spiritual terms, that is incredibly dangerous. Because there's a lot of things mixed in with a lot of falseness. And, and, and falseness is mixed in with truth. There is, there is so much New Age fooey <laughs> being presented as Christian religion in our time. There is stuff being presented from pulpits in America that when I was a young man would have never flown. They would have been thrown out of their denominal organizations. Not today. Today it's... It's amazing, the stunning air. But the Bible is the source of truth. Romans 8 and 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now here, here's what you have to understand. To be carnally minded is going to bring you death. But to be spiritually minded will bring you life and peace. Now we're encouraged to be spiritually minded, but... But in order to do so, all, all becoming spiritual by itself means is that I, I'm beginning to pay attention to the spirit world that is around me. And it's sort of like turning on a radio. I've said this before. You turn the radio on, and now all of a sudden you're tapping into things that were going on all around you. But you still then have to go into a deeper level of discernment to figure out what spirit you're tapping into. What are you listening to? It's not enough just to be spiritual. We have to be biblically sound. Anybody here? And I believe we can endeavor to engage the Spirit, and we must be careful, however, that we're not just engaging any spirit, but we want to engage the Holy Spirit. And I think that we can be spiritual people without going into Cookville. <laughs> but I see so many people who seek, you, you, you see it on the internet sometimes, and people will write in their profile, I'm spiritual but not religious. <laughs> that cracks me up every time. So basically what that's saying is, I'm unsubmitted and I'm uncommitted. <laughs> But I'm interested in the spiritual thing. That's just like sticking your finger in the air and just seeing which way the wind blows. It means very little. And what's funny is how many people think that that's actually something that's enlightened. There's so much interest in the spirit world. I, I remember when the psychic hotlines came out and the cultism and, and so forth has risen up. Now, because Satan will always, now hear me, Satan will always endeavor to get in the middle of your relationship with God. That's his modus operandi from the garden. It's exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. They had a beautiful relationship with God, but he got into the middle of them. God was speaking to them every day. But Lucifer worked his way into and interjected himself into that relationship and just started questioning things. Hath God said? Hath God? And, and, and it, he, does, he, he doesn't operate any new way. It's how he does it then. It's how he does it now. He constantly gets to try to question everything about the Word of God. And Satan tried to twist the Word of God with Adam and Eve, and it worked because Eve was not skilled enough in it yet, and Adam didn't have enough backbone yet. Because the Bible said she gave to eat with her husband with her. So blaming everything on Eve is not exactly a fair deal. Because I want to know, yes, she wasn't even there when God told Adam, but Adam was. Adam should have stood up and slapped the snake. <laughs> and said, yes, God said. Get out of here before I tie you into a knot. <laughs> now, to show you how ironically consistent the devil is, bring up Luke 4. And he literally tried to do the same thing to Jesus. God manifested in flesh. He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from here, for it is written. Now here, that's it. Here's the devil quoting scripture. 
He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt, thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all temptation, he departed from him. And watch this, only for a season. We never have total victory over the enemy to where we never have another battle. Hello? So we should not be so shocked. But here's what I'm wanting, I want you to see. Satan literally tried to quote the Bible to Jesus. And he did. But he quoted it out of context. And so we have all kinds of spirits of deceptions that are loose today doing the exact same thing. Taking the word of God, they'll use scriptures, but using it out of context. And you can create almost any doctrine you can think of if you're going to cherry pick verses. And so the, the question is, what if Jesus had not known the word? That's a rhetorical question because he was the word. <laughs> But what would have happened if Lucifer had been able to fool Jesus like he did Adam and Eve? Of course, he couldn't because Jesus knew better. But because he had a mastery of the word, he was able to have a victorious victory over the devil. And that's why you and I need to understand that we have got to know the word in order to navigate the craziness of the spirit world. 2 Timothy 2.14, bring it up on screen. And these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to, to the subverting of the hearers. He's saying, stay away from stuff that is just undermining people's faith. Now here's how you do this. Verse 15, study. Everybody yell study. I mean yell it. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Now here, here is, here's what it means. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what Jesus did that afternoon. Lucifer came to him with a Bible quotation. And Jesus dissected it, rightly divided it, and put one right back in his face. And the power of the word was so powerful, Satan had to leave. But he said in verse 16, but shun. Profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Uh, he's literally saying, ignore vain concepts and philosophies uh, that have no biblical grounding. Don't even bother taking the time to, once you have identified it as a false, unbiblical philosophy, stop toying with it. Stop reading more about it. Stop trying to seek more about, oh, I just want to be enlightened. No, no, no. What you're going to end up doing is becoming deceived. Because you're toying with a spirit world that is much more complicated and much more savvy than we tend to be. So the question tonight is, we were talking about dreams and visions as one of the forms of communication to God. Can Satan inspire dreams and visions? And the answer to that is certainly. Of course he can. But more importantly, I want to tell you what he does more importantly than that. And what he does more often than that is he is, he is easily able to inspire false teachers or false interpreters of dreams. Sometimes you can have a dream that literally did come from God. God was speaking to us, uh, but again, because Satan tries to get in between the relationship, he'll, he'll endeavor to send somebody into your life in the middle of it with a word from the Lord, an interpretation from the Lord. And if you're unskilled in the things of the word, you can sometimes get sucked into this stuff. So hear me. I want to show you why immorality is so dangerous in reference to spiritual things. 
and I'm talking first of all about spiritual leaders, but it goes beyond leaders. It goes to the saints of God because the New Testament church, the saints of God are baptized with the Holy Ghost and have access to, to spiritual gifts, one of which is the spirit of prophecy, which is the same spirit that operated under Old Testament prophets that did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now there's a difference between operating in a gift of prophecy occasionally and being in the office of a prophet. Those are two different things. And I don't have time to delve in much to that tonight, but I want to, where I'm heading with this is to us who are filled with the Holy Ghost, we're taught to seek spiritual gifts. We're taught to hunger after them. We want to be used of the Lord. And God has given this church an incredible access uh, to powers that only the elite of the Old Testament had access to. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we need to learn some things about how it operates. Because the Bible says in Romans 11 that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. That means they're irrevocable. That means if there was a time in your life, and now by the way, he doesn't just give out spiritual gifts. I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the nine spiritual gifts of 1 Corinthians. He doesn't give people spiritual gifts uh, unless they have come in a season of their life where they're, 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 they're prayerful and they're sincere and they're hungering after God and God will give. But when God gives a gift and allows a gift to operate, it's irrevocable. I'm going to let you think on that a minute. And since God will not just take away a spiritual gift, and by the way, the reason is because, first of all, you sought it, and you asked for it, and you hungered after it, and it is so valuable, and God gave it to us, uh, and now He expects us to honor it with our consistency. So what Satan does... Since the callings and elections of God are irrevocable, Satan gets in the middle of the relationship and he will endeavor to dilute the gift and the operation of it, dilute the spiritual flow and pervert it to a level that it becomes unsecure or unstable. It still works, but I can't control it. I don't mean control it in a negative way. I mean... In the positive way. I, I can't... It's like having a car. The, the old, the old uh, ignition switches used to have diodes on them. And when some of them would begin to go out, and you just have to turn the switch, and you never know when it would click on and not. It click, click, click. Oh, next one it would start. And you didn't say, you have the gift of ignition. <laughs> well, sometimes. Because it's been diluted. And it doesn't operate freely like it did. Or perhaps more importantly, when it operates, I can't understand it like I used to. I can't discern it like I used to because I'm in immorality. Because I'm carnal. Carnality affects our sensitivity. And so a perfect example of this is uh, Samson in the Old Testament. His immorality caused him to lose discernment and caused him to make decisions about his lifestyle. In his case, it was sexual immorality. But it caused him to make decisions uh, that diluted the ability of God to exercise his gift. Now, the gift did not totally go away. As a matter of fact, it operated one more time at his death when he pulled those pillars in. But there were other times the Bible said he went to operate as it always did and it wasn't there. What happened? You became carnal, Samson. God understands we're human. He's not asking for perfection out of us and flawlessness. But he is asking for sincerity. And when we lose that, we are drifting into a place where the spirit world will make mincemeat of us. Because God doesn't take away the spiritual gifts. The enemy dilutes them to such a way 
that the gift oftentimes ends up destroying the person itself. The very anointing that you sought God for can become the very thing that can so warp your mind you lose out with Him because you didn't take care of it and you didn't do right with it. Jeremiah in the 23rd chapter, turn with me there. There are several verses you need to read, some of which you probably need to underline in your Bible. Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 9. The Spirit of the Lord is dealing with Jeremiah concerning false prophets that had become rampant in Israel. And so he's addressing it here. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. Everybody say the prophets. Now again, I'm talking about Old Testament prophets here, people that were in the office of prophet, or at least thought they were, and, and I'm likening that a little bit again to the fact that we as New Testament saints have access to this same kind of level of spiritual power. Just by virtue of the time period in which we live. So when we look at them, we need to learn from them. All my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man. I'm like a man with whom wine hath overcome. Because the Lord, and, 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 everybody say and. Because of the words of His holiness. Jeremiah is saying, I know the word of God and what it says about holiness. And I'm seeing a, a, a batch of people uh, who have become so unholy. And he said, I'm shaking like a drunk man under the fear of God. The land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourneth, and pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. In other words, they're operating on another spirit. Verse 11. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall not be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them. Now watch closely. Even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen the folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people, Israel, to err. You know, it's one thing when you goof up your own life. But when you start damaging other people's faith and other people's spirituality, and that could even be your own spouse or your own children or grandchildren. There's a higher cost. Verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers and that none doth return from his wickedness. In other words, no one will repent. So God said this. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, now watch, I will feed them wormwood and make them drink the water for gale, gall, excuse me, and the room, uh, and for the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth uh, into all of the land. Now hear me, hear me tonight. Do not think... That God will not deal with our immorality sooner or later. Because we as the people of God, in order to function the way the church is supposed to function, uh, we have to have a level of spiritual cleanliness. Because without it, our spiritual operations will begin to falter. Not right at first, but over a series of time. God deals with them. He called them to repentance. He reached for them. He had, they had come to the point where they were so stubborn, they said, no, we're not going to repent. We're not returning from what we did. We're not, we're not going to do any of this. And so God said, all right, you have crossed a line now 
the, the callings and elections are without repentance, but here's what I'm going to do. I gave you the ability to tap into the Spirit, uh, but since you, are, you have chosen immorality and carnality, you're not able to rightly discern the operation of my gifts. So here's what's going to happen to you. I'm not going to take away the gift, uh, but I'm going to feed you wormwood. I think she said preach it. <laughs> That's poison. It's a demonic poison. In other words, your gift that used to flow freely in the Holy Spirit is now going to tap into and be led by an evil spirit. And the reality is, you have become so carnal and immoral that you can't even tell the difference. Verse 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Notice, notice what he said. He said they're preaching their own doctrine. They're preaching from their own heart. They are motivated by flesh, not by spirit. They say still unto them that despise me. The Lord has said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Did you catch that? God, God looked at them and said, I, I told them uh, that, there, that there, there's not, there's not going to be peace. And they said, oh, no, no, don't worry about that. Uh, nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing's gonna, can, can, is there anybody in the room that has enough discernment to immediately start thinking a bunch of TV evangelists right now in our time today uh, that is not doing that exact same thing? No evil will come upon you. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? What God was saying is, uh, he, said, uh, he said, you've got to know the word. You've got to mark the word. And you've got to compare it uh, with the word. Wow. There were gifted prophets. Now, not all of them. Some of them... You know, they, they, they were operating on a false spirit to start with, but many of them were, were righteous prophets at one time, but they had gotten into immorality in such a level, and again, it doesn't happen overnight, but it got into such a level that the spirit changed, the gifts kept operating. Skip down to verse 21. I have not sent these prophets yet they ran. I have not spoken unto them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from their evil doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets had said that prophesy lies in my name. Saying, now watch, here we go. This is what they say. I have dreamed. I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit, of the deceit of their own heart which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor. God wasn't denying that they weren't having dreams. The, the false spirits were speaking to them and, and leading them in dreams the way God's spirit used to. And they can't tell the difference. He that hath a word, he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Everybody say faithfully. Yeah. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is it not my word like as a fire, 
saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces. You know what God was literally saying? He was saying, I do not and I will not claim everything done in my name. And what modern saints need to wake up and understand is stop being fooled by everything that has a cross and a choir robe. Because there are some things in our land as well as all around the world uh, that are done under the name of Christianity, even under the name of Jesus, but they're not being led by God's Spirit. Uh, they are leading people like a Pied Piper, uh, literally going to cause thousands to be lost. And it started with immorality and carnality. False prophets will be lost. And if they destroyed others, the Word of God said that their blood will be upon their hands. In other words, they're going to be held accountable. Here's what I'm saying to the New Testament church. God said that to the Old Testament prophets with the level of gifts they had. And to understand that everybody in this room tonight has access as a New Testament apostolic believer to the same level of power that Old Testament prophets had access to through the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, if God required certain kind of things out of them, do not think He's not going to require the same thing out of us. So here's what I'm saying. Uh, you don't want to hunger after and toy with uh, spiritual things carelessly. Because Satan is a purveyor of false dreams. He's a purveyor of false everything. But I want to tell you what the bigger problem is. The bigger problem is unsubmitted flesh. That's the greater source of deception than the devil himself. That's why we have to walk with a clean heart before the Lord. That's how the role that morality plays in carnality versus spirituality. That's why you can, you can, you can you know, get away with some things for a season and for a while, but there'll come a point when something will take over and, and you won't even know what happened. Now, others will know it and even try to do an intervention and reach out for you. But by that time, pride and arrogance comes into the human spirit and you sort of chuckle at them because, after all, you're spiritually gifted. And the gift still operates. Yes, it's, it's irrevocable. But what is revocable is what spirit is available to be tapped into. Ezekiel 13, bring it up on screen. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Talking, in other words, have not seen him. He said they're seeing things. But they're being led by carnality. They're being led by their own spirit. And the reason their own spirit can do that is their own spirit is being led by a false spirit. Skip all the way down to verse 6. This is interesting. This is what he said they had seen nothing, but then he goes further in verse 6 and, and explains what they have seen is vanity and lying divination. Now this is the same people that were one time the people of God that walked in truth and righteousness and spiritual favor. But now they're operating in vanity and they're operating not under the divine but under lying divination. The Lord saith, saith and the Lord hath not sent them and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, but how be it, I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because, everybody yell because. 
because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see, or shall, excuse me, let me reread it. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies that they be not uh, in the assembly of my people. In other words, sooner he's going to remove them at some point. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. God said, I'll tolerate the false spirit only for a season, and then at some point, I'm going to remove you totally out of my house. And I'm going to extinguish your influence. Meanwhile, you run around so convinced of how gifted you are. It's not divine, it's divination. Lying divination is a false oracle. In other words, flesh did that. It was flesh that were operating. That's what he was talking about when he saw you're, we're either in the flesh or in the spirit. What that means is, and both of us can, can do, all of us can do both. You know, we are flesh and we, we do have spirit. But what's meant by it is, what are we being led by? What, what's influencing our thinking and our mind? Skip down to verse 16. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. God literally said their situation got so bad that God had to call the true prophets to come and literally prophesy against them. Now here's what I'm saying tonight. Unsubmitted, uncommitted flesh is incredibly dangerous. That's what I'm trying to say. Your spirituality is not removed from you if you ever received it correctly from seeking God. But what will happen is you will become overtaken by your own spiritual endeavors if you become uncommitted and unsubmitted. And when that happens, Satan does not even have to be the source of the dream or the vision or the word or whatever flow we're talking about. As long as he can manipulate your understanding of what's being preached or taught or heard or seen, he doesn't have to manipulate the actual word or the dream. He waits for the preacher to preach it. And then from the pulpit to our ears, he'll work everything he can to confuse it in our minds. I've, I've had conversations with people who have, and I've talked with them, and you know, they said stuff about, you know, this, that, and the other, what happened in a service to them, what God dealt with them. And, and honest, honest Pete, I have sat there thinking to myself, what? <laughs> what in the world did I say that gave you that impression? And it's because spirits of confusion and deception are loosed upon the people of God. When, when they cannot stop the purity of a pulpit, then the next thing, is, that's the first thing he tries to do, is to try to disrupt and corrupt the pulpit, corrupt the leaders, corrupt the mind of the spiritual leadership, the preacher. If he can do that, he's got the whole ball of wax. But if he can't do that, then the next thing is, uh, if I can't stop the dream or the word or the vision or the oracle or whatever, then I will try to endeavor to get them so carnal that they cannot even discern what they're hearing. The heart. What the Bible calls the heart, we call the mind or the feelings, emotions, the will. This is where God or Lucifer won 
is an, uh, uh, both are actually both are trying to get influence in our life. And if, if Lucifer can corrupt our heart like he did like he did Eve, we will derail ourselves. He does not have to destroy us. He can't, by the way. If he could, he would have already done it. Because that's a whole lot quicker. <laughs> but since he can't, the only thing he can hope for is he can get us carnal enough and unsubmitted enough and fleshly enough that we can no longer discern right from wrong and what's spiritual and not spiritual and we will end up getting led into something that destroys us. I'm sad to say I've had to watch that way too much in the last few years. Bring up Luke 6. A good man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everybody said amen. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He's like a man that built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the steam, uh, stream excuse me, beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it for the foundation. Uh, I'm sorry, because it was founded upon a rock. Verse 49, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without foundation built a house upon the earth, and against it the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. But here is what I'm trying to say. It was not the storm that destroyed. It was the condition of the heart that caused the mouth to speak the wrong things. It was unsubmitted, uncommitted, carnal people that Jesus said this happens to. And one of the reasons that this is so important is because we're told that words are spirit and they have life. And before anything can come out of our mouth, it has to pass through our mind. So, ergo... The condition of our mind is absolutely critical to the conditions of our words. And that means the enemy endeavors to twist up our thinking in order to destroy. Now, a little sidebar. This can happen even with dreams. The enemy can create dreams or visions you can have spiritual experiences. I, I, I told you the other day, I had something kind of interesting that happened to me. I, I was driving along, having a chat, kind of talking to the Lord, just, you know, but I was battling thoughts that were coming into me, and I, you know, I, I was responding. And This hasn't happened to me in a long time, but I, I got back to the office, and a man who is in the office of a prophet called me from about ten states away under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He said, the word of the Lord to you is, you were driving in a car talking to a spirit. But it wasn't God's spirit, son. God wants you to know you weren't, that wasn't his thoughts that, that was being delivered to you. Boy, that was relief. <laughs> I'm saying none of us are above this. This is where we live. This is spirituality. This is how we got to make our way through this stuff. The devil's a tricker. Tr tricker. And, and here's the thing. as a little sidebar. I, I taught about it in the earlier time. But this is why the two or three witness concept is a very critical safety valve. We don't receive a word without two or three witnesses. I think that, that if, if, and of course, you know, the more, the more highly... Uh, critical the word the more it should be tested and and i i i i saw something i didn't see before when we were uh bring up genesis 41 real quick remember when pharaoh's dreams god came and gave him the dream in the night and, and daniel interpreted and all that. We, we talked about all that here's one thing i didn't cover notice this uh verse one it came to pass at the end of two full years that pharaoh dreamed 
And behold, he stood by a river, and it begins to describe the dream. But here is what's interesting. Go down to verse 5. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up, and the one stalk rank and good. And it's, again, it goes to the. It was the same dream again, only with a different metaphor. Now, 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 here's why this is interesting. When God came to Daniel, you know, Pharaoh was so moved by these two dreams, God gave him a double dream, two witnesses. And he was so stirred by it, he calls his divination people in and mystics and says you either interpret this or I'm going to kill you man it must have been good to be king <laughs> them guys were moody <laughs> Daniel gets in the middle of it and Daniel interprets a dream but this is what Daniel told him bring up verse 32 this is interesting Daniel says to Pharaoh for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Literally, what he was saying is, is that Pharaoh, God used his own principles of the two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And he gave you the surety of it. Now, let me tell you what we need to do. Bring up Colossians chapter 3. Here's advice on what we got to do. Because carnality will destroy us. This is what we got to do. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, which Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, everybody say affection, on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life, shall appear. Then you shall appear with him in glory. What he's saying is, you and I became born again. We're now citizens of another land. And our mind and our thinking need to be predominantly on where we're going and not where we are. And here's how we do it. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And this is, he's describing, while we're in the earth, this is what we got to get a control of. Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. That means a desire for the forbidden. Covetousness. Which is idolatry. Verse 6. For which things sake... The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. Notice the past tense. But now, everybody say now. Because we're the people of God, we are also to put off these things. Now here are the things that we put off. Not only the things that he just mentioned, but add this to the list. Anger. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. In other words, put your eyes on Jesus uh, and keep renewing uh, your understanding uh, by looking at him, not the world. Look to him for understanding. Look, for, look to him for inspiration. Uh, and, and, and here is another point I want to make here. Putting off these things is our responsibility toward God. Well, I can't. Yes, you can. But I'll tell you this. You can't if you don't separate yourself and develop some personal holiness the way the Word of God taught you to do it. That's why personal holiness is so important. Because it helps keep the flesh desires and the craziness of it under a subdued condition. The flesh wars against the spirit. You cannot... Not, not, you have to be careful how much confidence you can have 
in a spiritual gift operation when you are in the condition of unrepented sin. Because spiritual things are not as trustworthy when we're being carnal. That's why Galatians 5 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth, or in other words, longs for things that are against the Spirit. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are, and this word ought to be underlined in your Bible, contrary one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you want to do. So that you cannot do the things you would want to do. So you cannot do the things (laughs) that you want to do. That's pretty much what it says. But if you be led of the Spirit, capital S, God's Spirit, you're, you're not even under the law. What he's saying is you don't even need the law. Because God's Spirit will never draw you into things that are contrary to His Word. Now the works of the flesh, just in case you need a list, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, Uncleanness, lasciviousness, means filthy, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, that means contentious debate, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, that that's, uh, means dissension, heresies, that's false doctrine, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which is uh, we would call rioting, and the such like. Of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care how much you come to church. I don't care how many times uh, you go in circles. I don't care how many times you still try to teach a class or do whatever spiritual occupation you were doing. If you continue in unrepented sin, the very gifts that God anointed you with will become the gifts that will lead you into darkness. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. If we fill our minds with junk, movies, music, etc., how can the gifts of the Spirit operate flowly and flawlessly if it's having to work through all kinds of muck and carnality of our flesh? The Apostle Paul had another listing yet in Romans. Bring up uh, Romans 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. In other words, the mind is to the point where it can no longer be stable enough to be used by God as a spiritual communication. And because of that, They're just going to do what they want to do. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, it's kind of like gossipers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents, ruh without understanding. Why don't they understand? Because they can't. The mind's blown. They're covenant breakers. In other words, contract breakers. Without natural affection. They're implacable. You know what that word means, by the way? It means without libation. And libation was a drink offering that was poured out unto the Lord. So what he's saying is when you become unplacable, it means you have no ability to offer anything to God. Unmerciful. Now here's, what's, here's the last verse of, of this, 32. This is what ties it all together. Who knowing the judgment of God, 
that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is where the will in us starts making choices. And this is where we decide, if we're, as people of God, if we're going to obey God or if we're going to disobey God. And carelessness in our lifestyle choices advocates carnality into our spirit. And that disrupts our ability to have a free-flowing move of the Spirit. I didn't say that we still don't feel the Spirit. And I didn't say that even like Samson, we couldn't even have spiritual gifts that operate from time to time. But, they, but there's no longer a clear signal. There's no longer, it's muddled. It works some, doesn't work some. Or if it does work, I don't understand exactly what just happened. And I'm confused and I'm... I can't think straight and I can't, I can't seem to figure out what to do. This is a spiritual condition. And when you're in that condition, any kind of dream or vision or gifts of the Spirit, since all of it has to flow through our mind, if our mind is a carnal mess, then all that stuff becomes unstable. And this is another, this is the main reason why, by the way, Lucifer loves to get us into sin. Because it makes us, while we still have a conscience, at some point our conscience gets seared. We don't even feel bad anymore about what we're doing. But until that happens, while we still have a conscience, we, we know we're not right. And so we don't want to, you know, we don't want to push the envelope. And so we will tend to hesitate when it comes to engaging the Spirit. And we will do like Adam and Eve when God's Spirit came to engage them like He did every day. Where were they? Hiding behind a bush. What happened? Adam, we can still talk. Yeah, but I can't understand like I used to, God. Something's, something's wrong with my mind now. Instead of wanting to be in your presence, I want to hide from your presence. I want to be led by the divine. I don't want to be led by divination. Philippians 4 and 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest or just or pure or lovely or of good report, if there's any virtue in it, if there's any praise in it, he says, think on these things. This is the reason why. Because our mind has got to be functional and, and, and cleansed by the Spirit in order for us to be able to engage the Spirit without demonic Deception. And finally, I'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You see, the Word of God is a healing balm to our mind. Now, emotions can be our worst enemy. God gave us emotions, but sometimes our emotions get damaged by life events. We can have a bad marriage or a bad childhood or wounded by caregivers or the list goes on but all that stuff makes us very vulnerable when you have damaged emotions you are you are very vulnerable to the work of the enemy and the thing that will heal it is the word because the word of god hebrews 4:12 is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, marrow, excuse me, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God knows exactly what's going on inside us. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest unto his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, seeing that 
that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Notice verse 15. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our, what? Infirmities. He's not touched with, when he said the feeling, he said, but yet without sin. He was tempted in all points, the next sentence says, like we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He was tempted in every way we were tempted, but he didn't sin. But his emotions were tested in every area. He is touched with the feeling of our emotions. He is touched. So, when you're fearful or you're afraid or you're wounded or hurt, offended, bruised, whatever, whatever's on the list, he said, don't just sit back and nurse it. Bring it to the throne. And you'll find grace and mercy. We need to be careful. Not to throw something good out with the junk mail. You ever do that? Come home to a stack of mail, going through it. Oh, good grief, and you just got a little quick judging something. <laughs> Better hope you don't throw out the Reader's Digest to check. <laughs> but I'm telling you that some of us are in circumstances through which we have been calling upon God. And I'm going to say to you in the Holy Ghost tonight, in some occasions, God already answered but your carnality was such that you judged it too quick and you threw it away as junk mail. Let's stand. By the authority of the Word of God, I speak tonight and deliver this Word as a messenger of heaven to this assembly. As a called bishop of this church, I loose this word into us tonight. And God, I'm asking you, this one can't slip away. I'm asking if they tend to discard it, I'm asking you to come behind with an angel and dig it out of the trash. Present it back to their mind again. Present it to them in a dream. Give them a vision. Do whatever you got to do. Shake us. we need to be a people that knows how to engage the spirit without being lost in deception I want every voice in this house to be lifted up right now and I want you to pray that the word of God would be burned into your mind tonight pray for yourself Make us what we ought to be, God. In Jesus' name. Grace is here tonight. Grace is here. But I'm telling you, some of you are headed in a direction. These things I've taught tonight are going to unfold on you if you don't recover yourself and repent.
I'm not in this pulpit to build your self-esteem. I'm in this pulpit to get you to heaven. Sometimes that means we got to hear something that's not always pleasant to our flesh. Greet four or five people around you tonight and bless them in the name of the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for being in the faithful to God's house tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday. It's going to be a great time.